Climate Change Forum 2022. Um, I hope you had a chance to have some coffee and some wonderful donuts from Eagle Brook. I, I want to thank them. Some of you remember our some of you remember our February 29th, 2020 forum. We did an overview of climate change impacts and introduced Deerfield 2030, a plan to make Deerfield more resilient and sustainable. Unfortunately, about two weeks later, we were derailed by COVID-19 pandemic and essentially have lost two years. We're here today to restart our efforts and focus in on what we can do collectively and accumulatively that together will have a positive effect on Deerfield, South County, and Franklin County. How we can adapt and thrive when faced with the overwhelming effects of climate change. What are our creative solutions um, to these intense storm events, droughts, and heat waves that are already occurring? When extreme weather occurs, who is our most vulnerable? Where is the most likely place for damage? And how do we ensure fair and equitable adaptation strategies for our communities? The challenges that we are facing with climate change are so huge and incredibly complex. It's easy just to go along, not pay attention, but we have to work together to have a more sustainable future. There has been a five-fold increase in weather-related disasters since when I was young, in the 70s, 60s and 70s. In 2020 alone, that was over, there was over 22 events that were a billion dollars or more. One, there were 18 that were a billion dollars or more here in the U.S. What ha is happening is the warmer air holds more moisture. And that's what the North Atlantic jet stream, our weather maker, is a major influence, is having on our weather. The Arctic cold and warm tropics, um, the temperature differential is less. So it slows down. It wobbles. And so we get pockets of hot heat, like the 120 degree weather that the Northwest had last summer, or our July storms where we had intense record-setting uh, water events. This is what we're facing. The good news as far as climate change goes, this is the place to live. We will have a lot less of the awful effects, and we are aware of a lot of our vulnerabilities already. We can have, if we work together in a concert, in concerted effort, each of us can have and be a good steward of our little slice of earth. We can do this and have a yard by yard solution. We can build community resilience together. We can have whole neighborhoods that can enjoy birds, dragonflies, bees, and beat the damn mosquitoes. We can, so you gotta, you gotta have dragonflies. We can reduce waste to the transfer station. We can eliminate pesticides and herbicides to improve our health and the habitat's health. We can plant native species, have rain gardens, pocket parks, open space. We can enjoy homegrown fruit and veggies. We can improve soil health to store, filtrate the quality of water improves and then release it in drought conditions. We can conserve and manage our excess water together we can ask, we can have town-wide conversations on resiliency together. We can ask Joe and Natalie to help us and make the state have more green solutions that are affordable to everybody. We can make individual choices that have a cumulative effect, have cooler and safer neighborhoods, trees and open space. Living sustainably does not require major lifestyle choices. It can be done as simple as switching to refillables that reduce packaging. You can plan your schedule and errands to make less trips, carpool. You can switch out your shower heads and you don't have to give up pressure 
and save on your sewer and water bills. You can cut food waste and promote food security by eating in season, with the season, and buying local as much as you can. Our farmers are the future. Our, we have the best soil in the world. As yields dry up elsewhere, we are going to be the breadbasket. This is a yard by yard, household by household solution. We can do this. I know that everyone will be able to pull together and we will have a really great deer field in 2030. I hope everyone enjoys the day and I hope you enjoy a lunch from Deerfield Academy. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. And I also want to welcome you all um, here today. Thanks so much for coming. Um, our theme today is what individuals, homeowners, and towns can do to affect um, climate change. And I guess the backdrop for our um, discussion today is Elizabeth Warren has uh, famously said, climate change is the existential threat of our time. Um, and some of you may have seen um, this movie. Um, however, unlike this movie, where the citizens of Earth can't seem to muster a response to an existential threat in the form of a, an asteroid heading straight toward us, um, in the case of climate change, there is really much that, that we can do, um, and it's attainable and, and everyone can participate. So our goal today um, is to motivate you all to take actions that make a difference on climate change and climate resiliency, and we want to provide you with the information and the tools um, to help make that happen. Today we have nine workshops and 32 speakers to help you um, and, and understand how to take that kind of action. And I have to say I'm amazed at the, the wealth of, of knowledge and the incredible array of expertise that we have in today's speakers. Um, it's really an impressive group. Um, I personally wish I could attend all of the workshops, but um, if you can't, um, obviously you won't be able to do that, but if, if you um, wanna see workshops that you missed today, uh, as you'll notice, uh, FCAT is videotaping all of the workshops and they will be posted on the FCAT YouTube page. Um, and th thank you for doing that. Um, and also broadcast on Channel 12 and Deerfield 15. So um, Massachusetts has set a goal for the state of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Massachusetts 2050 decarbonization roadmap the state can't um, do this job alone, however, um, and state actions need to be complemented by actions from individuals, from homeowners, from cities and towns. So 2050 is only 28 years away, and there's a lot to be done. Um, I'm hoping that I'll still be hanging around on the planet at that time um, and thinking about that goal. I'm, I'm thinking for myself about what I need to do as an individual um, and I probably will need to replace my car with an electric vehicle, replace my gas stove um, with an electric one, replace my gas furnace with electric heat pumps, tighten up my home with um, some home energy and heating efficiency things, and add to my solar array to um, produce the renewable electricity that all of those things need. It's a lot to do, um, but it is doable over time as things need um, replacement and taking advantage of current and future um, government incentives that are available. So our workshops today are really designed to help you understand and, and think about all these kinds of actions. Cities and towns also need to take action and workshops today will cover these issues as well. There are really two aspects of addressing climate change. It breaks down to climate mitigation and climate resiliency and mitigation are actions to reduce our carbon footprint and reduce global warming. For towns, those steps look a lot like the uh, things that I just described for individuals, transitioning to electric vehicles, making buildings more energy efficient, installing heat pumps and solar panels. Resiliency is actions that um, are to prepare for things like the, uh, the impacts of extreme weather events and more flooding. 
which are things that we face here in Deerfield. Deerfield has been a real leader in making progress on all of these fronts, effectively using um, grants from the MVP program or Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program to achieve climate goals. Deerfield adopted its Municipal Vulnerability Plan in 2017 and became the first um, community in Massachusetts certified as an MVP community. This plan um, made the town eligible for MVP action grants, and Deerfield has now received five um, MVP grants totaling $1.3 million for climate resiliency projects. The town also has an established MVP core group that meets monthly to coordinate um, this work. So some examples of things that Deerfield's been doing. Um, the biggest impact expected with climate in, in Deerfield is, is increased flooding. So we've been trying to address that um, first and foremost. Um, we've done replacement of two failing culverts um, with new culverts that are sized for the larger storms that are expected with climate change. And they're designed with an open bottom um, configuration to promote fish and wildlife passage. So the images show here show um, the Mill Village Road um, replacement culvert sort of before and after, how much of an improvement that made. And similarly, we did the, the same type of project at, at Kelleher Drive. Deerfield's also taken some other steps as well. The town's adopted a new policy to, to promote green infrastructure in new town and private development projects. Um, there are green parking lots that have been designed for the town center Leary lot and the frontier parking lot. Two rain gardens were designed and installed at Deerfield Elementary School. And six tree box filters um, were installed in the town center. All of these green infrastructure projects are designed to reduce flooding and pollution. Um, and these photos are showing some of the tree box filter installations on Elm Street and Main Streets in the town center. Deerfield has also completed some innovative zoning initiatives to connect um, to cl climate resiliency and mitigation, adopting green development performance standards, improved floodplain and, and solar zoning, and a detailed plan for land conservation in the Deerfield River floodplain has also been adopted by the town. Deerfield created and promoted a new rave alert system for emergency notifications and adopted a flood evacuation plan in the event of a catastrophic dam failure on the Deerfield River. The town's also been active in climate-related public outreach and education. Um, we've now sponsored two climate forums um, in 2020 and now this year. And uh, we've worked with teachers now at Frontier for several years to set up uh, a new climate curriculum in the middle school and the high school um, with uh, science classes here at, here at Frontier. So now my job for today is to kind of lay out the plan for the, for the day. And if you, if you look at your agendas, um, you'll see that this morning we have this plenary session, and then we have one set of concurrent um, workshops that happen in three different venues um, in the school. Um, one set are, are here in, in the auditorium, and the other two are on the second floor in the media center, which you will find by following signs through the, the corridor and the map that you have in your, in your packets. Um, so we'll have a catered lunch um, in the cafeteria, um, and then this afternoon we'll have two more sets of concurrent workshops winding up around 3.15 p.m. So just um, check your programs and, and just take note that some of the speakers have changed. Um, so select the programs and, and workshops that are the best fit for you. Um, so we have moderators that are going to keep track of time um, for each of the workshops and um, want to try to encourage folks to move between the workshops fairly quickly, but we do have a 15-minute break between each of the workshops. Um, also, be aware that there are some handouts um, in, in your packet. To, um, there's a fact sheet and some other things to, to pay attention to, and we have some display tables both outside the auditorium and in the cafeteria that I'd encourage you to check out. And at lunchtime, we'll have electric vehicles um, in the parking lot. If you're interested in seeing what some of the, these models look like, um, there'll be four or five um, electric vehicles right outside the, the front door that you can look at during lunch. 
Um, I also want to um, take the time right now, since we won't have time at the end, um, to do some acknowledgments um, for all the uh, contributors to this event. Um, particularly want to thank all of the presenters, um, of which there are so many, for taking so much time to put your, your programs together. I want to thank the Deerfield Select Board, town officials and volunteers from town that have participated and helped with this. Uh, Frontier Regional School for providing the space. Deerfield Academy, providing a free catered lunch for everyone. Eagle Brook School, which provided the coffee and donuts this morning. I want to thank the uh, Mass um, Municipal Vul uh, Vulnerability Preparedness Program, which provided grant funds to, to do this program and the towns of Conway, Sunderland, and Waitley, uh, which are our co-sponsors here today. So um, I'm going to now um, just introduce our next presenter, um, who is Michael Rollins. Uh, Michael is the Associate Director of Climate Research of the Climate Research Center at UMass. Um, and he's uh, an associate professor in the Department of Geosciences at UMass Amherst. His research fo focuses on understanding Earth's climate system through synthesis and observations and numerical models. He's recently applied high-resolution re climate pr model projections to characterize future changes in seasonal temperature and precipitation patterns across the Northeast U.S. and North America. And Michael is going to talk to us today about how Franklin County's climate is expected to change. Michael. Thank you, Chris. Um, I want to thank the organizers, the hosts, uh, for having me here, and to everybody for being here. Uh, I'm going to spend the next few minutes, hopefully, giving you a very brief, um, basic overview of some of the climate changes we can expect here um, by mid-century and late in the century, focused mainly on air temperature and precipitation, and focused also on the magnitude of change, both the magnitude, how much, and also the direction of some of these changes. And we'll focus on the global picture and also uh, locally as well. So as far as global temperatures, take home message here is that global temperatures have already increased by about one degree Celsius, around 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit for the global temperature. So this chart here shows since the pre-industrial era, era, so let's say the late 1800s, temperatures have warmed by about one degree Celsius. And the idea is, we, as many of you know, we want to keep global, glo the global average temperature warming under about two degrees Celsius. Two degrees Celsius is about the level where we really expect a lot of very, very worrisome uh, impacts. So also the future warming that we, can, that we are expected to see, as many of you know, is dependent on our actions, our activities. There's a higher emission scenario, which globally, global average temperature, we can expect warming of upwards of four to six degrees Celsius by the end of the century under the higher emission scenario lower warming if we get our act together, so to speak, and mitigate some of this temperature increases. Locally, temperatures here have already warmed by about 1.4 degrees Celsius here in uh, western Massachusetts. So this time series here shows the average global, uh, the annual average temperature since the late 1800s shows warming of about 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit, 1.4 Celsius, and that warming is actually greater than the warming we've seen as far as the global average temperature. So the warming we're seeing here in the Northeast U.S. is basically ahead, is we're warming more rapidly than the global average temperature. Looking out toward mid-century in about 50 to 60 years, um, warming under the higher emission scenario may be as much as about six degrees, or I should say under the lower emission scenario, about six degrees Fahrenheit we can expect um, in both around winter and summer 
under the lower emission scenario. Under the higher emission scenario, we might expect to see more warming. So as far as Celsius goes, we're looking at about 3.3 degrees Celsius by mid-century or so, 50 or 60 years. Now remember, we've already seen about one degree Celsius warming. We want to keep global average warming under 2C. We're already seeing, or we could expect to see about three degrees Celsius, about six Fahrenheit by mid-century uh, in this region. Okay, so how will these, in the future, this winter and summer warming, well, how will they feel? How will they compare to current times? Well, the future projections for winter temperatures, you can see in this upper chart, the coldest winters in the future will be like the warmest winters of recent years. So you can see in the future here, winter temperatures may warm, um, winter temperatures may in the future be as warm as about 40 degrees Fahrenheit under the coldest winters in the future that's warmer than the warmest winters of the recent past, okay? In summer, the hottest summers that we're currently seeing here, about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, well, they'll be the coolest summer temperatures that we'll see later on this century, okay? To get us an idea of how this will feel, let's say when we combine air temperature and humidity, the heat index, how temperatures will feel, well, under some projections, the temperatures that we'll feel in the future, let's say by the end of the century, may feel more like what we currently have seen experienced in the mid-Atlantic states, let's say southern Pennsylvania, Delaware, northern Virginia. Under the higher emission scenario, by end of the century, things may feel here, the heat index, more like South Carolina. These kind of comparisons give us a really good understanding idea of how things will feel when we take, make these maps and show how our climate will transition to feel something like what's experienced in the Southeast. And I know mo many of you folks have been to the Southeast and visited, we know what it's like in uh, those temperatures in the summer. Obviously, with the increase in temperature, we can expect more extreme heat events. Uh, these charts are showing Boston, days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and currently we see these days about 10 degrees, 10 days each year that exceed 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, depending on the emission scenario and how far out we go, uh, those number of days above 90 uh, may increase quite substantially. We might look at it as many as um, 64 days each year under the higher emission scenario by the end of the century for Boston. Uh, similar numbers here, we may not see as many days over 90 as Boston does, uh, urban heat island effect. Um, days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the same thing, a rapid increases in the number of days at that temperature. These extreme heat uh, events, um, they have impacts on um, our health. Uh, this was a recent study that was done for the state of Rhode Island that looked at the increase in the number of uh, extreme heat days. So in recent decades, since the 1960s, the number of days above these thresholds uh, have increased. Along with that increase in extreme temperatures, there's a relationship with, between the maximum daily temperature and the relative risk of emergency room visits, which goes up quite substantially at temperatures above about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So we, we know we see more uh, emergency room visits, and those emergency room visits um, are expected to increase quite substantially by the time we get out to the end of the century. So um, under with these extreme heat events, uh, as much as a tenfold increase perhaps in the number of heat-related um, visits to emergency rooms. In addition to temperature changes, we can expect precipitation changes in this region. And we've, we've seen those already. So annual total precipitation in this region, uh, this is for a time series for Franklin County, shows that there's been an increase in recent decades in total precipitation, both rain and snow. Uh, the three wettest years on record for Franklin County have occurred since 2008, just in the last 14 years. So we have about a good record of about a uh, over 100 years of data since the late 1800s where we could trust the data. Annual total 
precipitation uh, has increased uh, significantly. Along with that increase in annual total precipitation or, or a seasonal total precipitation, we're seeing more extreme precipitation events. The Northeast U.S. has seen a bigger increase in extreme precipitation events, let's say the number of days over one inch each year. Uh, the Northeast has seen a bigger increase than any other part of the U.S. Uh, interestingly, if we look at this map, I'll just add it. Notice how the Southwest U.S. has also seen an increase in extreme precipitation events. While it's been drying overall, annual total precipitation is going down, the number of extreme events is actually going up. And that's going up more in the Northeast U.S., about 71% increase in the Northeast U.S. versus the rest of the U.S. And of course, these extreme precipitation events are leading to devastating floods in recent years. Uh, we've seen that in this region across the Northeast U.S., many parts of the globe. Uh, we like to say as far as changes globally, the wet areas will get wetter and the dry areas will get drier. Well, that's a basic, um, basic understanding of climate change um, globally. Rain and snow in Massachusetts, uh, projections for the future, winter precipitation, uh, mostly winter precipitation is expected to increase uh, significantly this century. Uh, we're not so sure about summer. Um, the models give us conflicting uh, projections for summer precipitation, but in general, winter precipitation is expected to increase uh, more under the higher emission scenario in the future, uh, but that doesn't mean we'll see more snow. So it's very likely, very likely in this region, we're going to see more rain in the winter, less snow. More total precipitation, but less snowfall. And that's shown here in this time series going out uh, toward the end of the century. Under the higher emission scenario, snowfall will decrease in this region. And that obviously has big implications for recreation. And also I should mention rivers, when we lose that big snowpack in the winter time, we'll see less um, higher flows during the snowmelt period um, in the early spring as well. And that has implications for um, fish in the rivers and streams as well. Lastly, um, not as much an impact obviously in the western part of the state, but sea level rise. Sea level has been increasing uh, around about a foot on average across the eastern U.S. Uh, that's projected to increase in the future as well. Um, along near Boston, a big increase in the last couple decades, recent decades, in the number of uh, flooding events along the coast. Communities in Boston and other communities along the East Coast will obviously have to prepare for that. Um, we've got projections of sea level rise. Um, in the interest of time, I won't spend a lot of time here talking about sea level rise. And um, I guess I'll just leave you with um, some information on some strategies and actions. Uh, there's a lot of resources uh, for more information, climateinquiry at geo.umass.edu. Uh, much of this information that I presented here was put together by um, some colleagues of mine at UMass Amherst. We have similar uh, information for other states uh, in the region. Um, we can give you more base, uh, more detailed information if you like about some specifics about some cli other climate related changes, growing season length, uh, thresholds, things like that, snow cover changes, projections in snow cover and snow water equivalent uh, and such. And I want to acknowledge and thank Professors Carmel Carr and Raymond Bradley as well who help, help put together some of this information. Um, the Northeast Climate Adaptation and Science Center is a great resource at UMass Amherst for some of this information, looking at local impacts and adaptation. And um, thank you very much. Sure. So we have a little bit of time for questions. Yes. I wonder if you can comment on the impact on potholes. <laughs> Some potholes. Yeah. So potholes. So um, potholes. My, my fear is yeah. due to freezing and thawing, and as we have more rain and melting and days above 32 in the winter, we're going to see more potholes. 
So, so I'm not sure if there's, there's reason to believe that there may be a more variability in the number of days that we cross freezing and then drop below. That timing is likely to shift earlier, obviously. So rather than that, that happening, let's say, in maybe early to mid-March, that may advance and we might see that more pothole season in like late February. But I don't know as far as the number of days, the, I think the key indicator would be the number of days that have where you go do that swing above and to, to create the potholes above freezing and below freezing. And I don't know that that variability will increase in the future. But it, certainly that would maybe shift. So that would might say we would need to prepare and understand that there'll be pothole season will come a little bit earlier. But whether that will extend now, certain regions of the country, you'll probably see that pothole season will be for a long stretch right through, let's say, late January, where they used to be frozen then, and now they're, they're thawing. Yeah, but will there be actually an increase in the number of days, more, like more potholes? I'm not sure we can say more potholes, but I think that would shift to earlier for certainly as we warm. Yes. Uh, Mike, your um, charts are all based on high emissions, medium, and low. What, can you categorize that a little bit better for us? Is high emissions like current um, continue on with no change? That Can everybody hear the question? No. So, what, so the question is, the emission scenarios, high, medium, and low, are they, what are they based on? Kind of, how do we link those with activities, human activities? So the high emission scenario, unfortunately, our current trajectory, the last, let's say, 10 years, we are on a higher emission scenario. We have not done, globally as a community, we have not done what it needs, we need to do to get to a more lower emissions trajectory. So some of these scenarios that I've shown I showed maybe low, medium, and high, and a couple I showed high and low. The low emissions is really pretty optimistic. It really means getting our act together, getting to net zero emissions by 2030, by 2050 globally, you know, really aggressive actions for those lower emission scenarios. And unfortunately, we, we, there's no evidence that we're getting our, our act together glo as a global community to get us away from that higher emission scenario in the next few years. The lower emission scenario is very aggressive actions that are going to take a lot of work. I think I saw a hand up in back here first, then we'll get here. Yeah, I, I would say I, I would have to defer to ecologists about what, what species are proper, like not bringing in, in some species that would be considered ev invasive and cause problems in the future. But, I, but assuming that altering what we plant based on the future climate, we're pretty sure it's going to get warmer and wetter. So if we can change what we plant, uh, certainly as far as agriculture, as far as what we grow to eat, I think we should certainly be cognizant of avoiding planting things that might not survive the heat extremes. But in consultation with ecologists who understand plant, you know, plants better than I do, I'm a climate scientist, but um, I think there's some merit in considering shifting what we grow for both ornamental and consumptions. Yeah. Precisely, yep. So question was the water, understanding of the 
perception that the water table has been rising linked to climate changes? Uh, of, uh, yes, for certain. So the, I've shown the precipitation has tended to get wetter. We're seeing more, um, basically, the extreme events, but also the season on the annual total, winter getting wetter. So as we're getting more precipitation over the last, let's say, decades now, groundwater tends to respond a little more slowly than um, near surface. But with this trend toward more total precipitation over long periods, years, and seasons, water tables certainly come up. We've seen that in the groundwater wells. A lot of there's monitoring. My colleagues are monitoring the wells, and that's a clear climate signal. And so then when you have a water table close to the surface, you're more likely to see low areas get flooded under moderate precipitation events. Yes. Yeah, these are good, this is good questions. I'm a, I'm a physical climatologist. I study this intensely in the Arctic, actually. And so there are implications. The most basic implication is with less frozen ground, let's say in late winter and early spring, you're more likely to get infiltration. You're, le you're, you're actually going to see less overland runoff versus when it's, fro when it's frozen and you, let's say you get, have a snowpack and you get a lot of rain and it's frozen soils, then you get a lot of overland runoff. You see all the streams come up rapidly. Over time, you're likely to see that become less of an issue as the ground is less frozen here and, you, and then you're able to infiltrate more and then you're able to actually during that time of year, let's say there's less snow, more frozen soil in, or more unfrozen soil in March this time of year, you're going to get more infiltration and less stream flow. That's going to replenish groundwater. It's going to do things like that. Um, I'm not sure that's a neg. That's really a neg. That's really not a much of a negative. But the biggest change is by losing the snowpack, the heavy deep snowpack, and and seeing less of a snowpack, we're seeing less of that river flow, a stream flow. So things that are accustomed to having this big snowmelt pulse in the streams this time of year are going to see that as less over time. It'll be, there'll be a less of a big bump. The Connecticut River, you'll see less high flows and more just a mod, you know, modest bump up. But that loss of snowpack is going to be a big implication here. Declining snow. snow. Thanks. Thank you. So our, uh, our next two speakers probably don't need any introduction, and, and we're uh, so pleased that they're able to take time out of their busy schedules to, to join us today. Um, state Senator Joanne Comerford was, was elected to the State Senate to represent the Hampshire, Franklin, and Worcester District in 2018 as a write-in candidate, and she's the first woman to hold this seat. In her first session as State Senator, Joe was appointed to this as Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Public Health. Multiple bills that Joe has, has filed have, have been passed into law, including legislation on carbon sequestration and soil health, a study of the restart of passenger rail along the Route 2 corridor, and establishing a net zero energy building code. Now in her second session in the State Senate, Joe has been reappointed as State uh, as Senate Chair of the Public Health Committee and also chairs a newly formed Joint Committee on COVID-19 and Emergency Preparedness and Management. State Representative Natalie Blay has worked on behalf of the residents of Western Mass in various public positions for over a decade. She was sworn into office as the first female state representative for the 1st Franklin District in January 2019. Natalie proudly represents one of the most rural districts in the Commonwealth that includes 19 communities spanning three counties and 500 square miles. Natalie is vice chair of the Joint Committee on Children, Families, and People with Disabilities. She's also a member of the Joint Committees on Tourism, Arts, and Cultural Development, Transportation, and Ways and Means. And prior to becoming state representative, Natalie served as congressional aide to U.S. Representatives John Olver and, jo and Jim McGovern for a decade. 
So they'll be talking to us about state climate programs, legislation, and initiatives. Welcome. Thank you so much, Chris, and thank you to all the organizers of today's forum. We're going to pass this back and forth. We are. Thank you, everybody, for having us here this morning. It is great to see you all. It's nice. So thank you uh, to everybody who organized this and gave us the opportunity to be together in the same space to be talking about this really important issue. Um, so we've prepared a few slides. We're also happy to take your questions. Um, and we're going to start with a bit of uh, an overview um, into what the state has been doing. Of course, this is before Natalie and I had the opportunity of serving on your behalf. Uh, but in 2008, of course, we passed something called the Global Warming Solutions Act in the Commonwealth. Again, our colleagues who predate us did this good work, along with perhaps advocates in this room. Um, it made Massachusetts one of the first states in the nation to move forward with a comprehensive regulatory program to address climate change, although the urgency of that last, um, that last uh, overview makes me want us to move more quickly, and I know that this is a, a shared value here. So it required uh, 2020 and 2050 emissions reductions, and it used 1990 as a baseline, um, which is, I think, important for us to understand. Um, and so, you know, we ask ourselves, did we hit the 2020 emissions reduction goals according to the Global Warming Solutions Act? And COVID had a lot, to, a lot to do with it, but the current data indicates that we may have come close to hitting those 2020 uh, emissions goals as projected by the 2008 Global Warming Solutions Act. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So the Global Warming Solutions Act was not the only major climate legislation in 2008. The legislature also passed the Green Communities Act. The law changed the way that Massachusetts procures energy resources. It made our Commonwealth a leader in energy efficiency and required utilities to provide energy efficiency programs to consumers, which I know many of you have taken advantage of in this room. It required us to invest in energy efficiency before producing more power. And it changed the Commonwealth's analysis towards building new fossil fuel power plants and required exploring investments in energy efficiency first. So our Commonwealth would use the energy resources we did have more efficiently. The Green Communities Act also strengthened the renewable portfolio standard and strengthened our energy net metering program and it created the Green Communities Program. This has been a wonderful success that many of our communities, especially here in Western Massachusetts, have taken advantage of. There are now 280 green communities in the Commonwealth, including nearly every town in our districts. The Green Communities Program enables our cities and towns to make energy efficiency improvements and implement clean energy projects. And in 2017, the Municipal Vulnerabilities Preparedness, or the MVP program, which I want to acknowledge, where's Carolyn? Carolyn. Carolyn has been a tremendous leader in the MVP program. <laughs> Having been asked by the governor to come into the State House and testify in support of this program and how it's been used right here in Deerfield. So thank you, Carolyn. I know that there are a number of workshops today on these important programs that are so critical for our towns. Okay, so we're going to fast forward now. I'm going to put on my glasses so I can actually see something. Um, we're going to fast forward now to today um, and the legislature's work in our time and Natalie and my time to pass an omnibus piece of climate legislation at the end of the last session. It was vetoed by Governor Baker, so at the start of this session it was repassed. Um, it requires the Commonwealth to achieve net zero emissions, uh, emissions levels by 2050. And here we want to say, both Natalie and I want to say, that we understand that many of you in this room think that net zero isn't fast enough, it's not aggressive enough, we want 100% renewable energy. Um, we're just saying what is in the current climate legislation and what we're governed by currently. So. Uh, a very good provision, I believe, in this bill is that the bill itself has strict interim emissions reduction requirements. So it includes 2030 limits, um, which are approaching, right? 
and we all have to take note of those 2030 benchmarks. It includes emission reduction goals specific to the sectors. Um, so there are different sectors that have to meet see these sublimits. That's also very important. Um, and it includes a, a public five-year plan from EEA. Um, and here, I just want to really honor the work of Secretary Theo Herides and her team. This is not easy, um, but five-year public plans to reduce. So there are concrete, measurable benchmarks to which we all have a relationship. Um, and the law requires these five-year plans from EEA to be pretty comprehensive. Uh, EEA must track emissions reductions from various solutions, including tracking carbon sequestration from natural and climate solutions. And this was something that Natalie and I pushed for. I added this language via an amendment in the Senate bill because it's important that as we work to implement these climate solutions, we have to measure and account for the carbon sequestration and natural climate solutions as part of this overall plan. And here, and I know Natalie feels this way too, we are in this region, if you look at the sequestration maps available, we're basically breathing for the Commonwealth and much of New England. Other states do not have the density of carbon sequestration that we have here, which is why I know, I know you feel this way too. I feel it acutely um, that we have to really help the Commonwealth understand the kind of programs that we need to put in place to really have these natural and working lands be able to even grow in size, but, all, but certainly be protected. Um, so this, yeah, <laughs> I think we, we should all clap for carbon sequestration for sure. Um, it also, this bill also it, uh, defined environmental justice into law for the first time. That's important, right? Um, racial injustice as executed by these environmental uh, dichotomies, right? are acute and ever-present. Um, and so it was good that we encoded this into law. Um, it allows that defini de definition to be used for things like restricting where biomass plants uh, can be cited and more. Um, uh, the bill also accelerated the rate in which our renewable portfolio standard, or RPS, is increasing, also important. And so the electricity suppliers, the idea here is the electricity suppliers will be required to procure more and more and more of their energy from renewable sources, right? Uh, and the hope is that demand for renewables will continue to increase. Um, and it also, it, it also required the development of a net zero emissions stretch building code. Natalie talked about green communities, green communities, many, of, many communities in our region are green communities. They have a stretch code, but that stretch wasn't much of a stretch. As we look at the pending climate catastrophe and we, we look at where technology and other building methods are, have gone. So we needed a net zero emissions code. This was a bill I filed with Natalie's support. Um, and so it, 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 is, uh, and it requires that the state uh, roll out a stretch code. That is still in process. Many of you are engaging here to help the state understand how far the stretch code can stretch, um, the net zero stretch code can stretch. It required the Department of Public Utilities to, co to consider climate change. This was the first time the DPU had to consider climate change. And it reformed the Mass Save program, um, which, as you know, promotes energy efficiency. I just have to stop for a minute and go a little off script and say how lucky we are to have State oh. Senator Joe Comerford. <laughs> It is. <laughs> now we're going to do a big love fest. No, no, no. It's, it's impossible. It's, we, we work as a team. It's impossible that she just did this. We're, we're, oh, come on. <laughs> we're really lucky. Um, OK. So is this slide five? Yeah, we, fine. We've moved it? OK. Yeah. So as Senator Comerford noted on the last slide, the legislature began this session with an omnibus climate bill after the governor vetoed it. I just want to note that again. Uh, both branches are now considering multiple pieces of major climate legislation, which is really, really exciting. Uh, because of your efforts, this has been raised up as an issue that we absolutely have to take action on. The House passed a bill focused on offshore wind in late February, and we know that Massachusetts is a national leader in offshore wind. This bill 
ensures that we have a skilled green energy workforce by investing in workforce training and will attract world-class manufacturers to Massachusetts so that the entire offshore wind supply chain is right here in Massachusetts. By the end of the decade, offshore wind will generate 25% of our Commonwealth's current electricity demands. The House's bill will also, well, it included crucial provisions on our electricity grid, which we'll talk about on the next slide. But these grid modernization provisions are familiar to you, certainly, but they're familiar to Senator Comerford and I because uh, it was our bill. <laughs> Natalie got this in. <laughs> Oh, it's me. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, so the House nailed it um, with the bill that the House passed. And that provision, Natalie and I did file that bill. Natalie got it in the House bill. Um, and uh, the grid modernization is acutely needed. I think we all, all know here in Western Massachusetts. The Senate hasn't acted yet. So we're on the hook um, for climate legislation this session. Um, Fingers crossed, um, we'll see something around Earth Day. Um, and so the Senate bill, because the House nailed wi wind energy, the Senate bill is gonna look different. Um, and, you know, I don't have, um, I wish I were omniscient to be able to know exactly uh, what the Senate's going to do. Um, but I'll just give you some understanding. It's gonna be a pretty top line understanding because the bill is being baked right now uh, by Senator Barrett, uh, who chairs uh, the TUE committee. So we imagine that we're going to take up transportation emissions. Um, again, Secretary Theo Herides has been and had been leading a multi-state effort to cap emissions from the transportation sector that was called the TCI. Um, that effort has stalled um, as other New England states bailed. So we need a new plan um, to address transportation emissions. Um, we have to continue pushing on the decarbonization of our building sector. Transportation and buildings are two places that we have to look in, ter in terms of achieving this uh, net zero goal. Uh, so the Next Generation Climate Act required this development, we talked about this, of the net zero energy stretch code um, in green communities. And a draft, again, of the net zero building code has been developed by DOER and we thank them for that. And it's now open for public comment, but and this is a huge but. Our existing buildings are a significant contributor, right? About 40%. Um, and we need to push, uh, in terms of a net zero stretch code, um, to building renovations as well as building construction. That is a major gap right now um, that we're seeing in terms of being able to lower those building emissions. Um, and many of you, I know, have submitted comments on that. So I know that the Senate is looking at policy options um, in that direction, as well as perhaps an expanded bottle bill, um, which many of you have talked about. Um, we must do that. Um, we must prevent large-scale biomass plants um, from being able to get state subsidies. Um, that is a bill that is... Um, uh, that is a bill that is currently before the legislature. Um, the, as we said, the, uh, the, the, the omnibus uh, legislation that was passed recently, right, curtailed where biomass plants can be located. Um, and it's, it's, they circle environmental justice communities. And so when we looked at a map, and, and the, the House and the Senate chairs of TUE did this, um, Biomass plants are still able, large-scale biomass plants are still able to be located, uh, again, plants that would receive state subsidies, and you know where a lot of them would be located? Right here in Western Massachusetts, especially in Northern Franklin County, um, where they would be outside the zone, um, now prevented. Um, so that is something that uh, Rep. Lay and I have been speaking to our TUE chairs about, uh, as well as Senator Hines. Um, and then we're going to talk later, just in a moment, about the single tax parcel rule, which is a super uh, wonky thing that both Rep. Lay and I have been working on. Yeah, as we said, it's a really exciting time with so many climate bills pending. The House is also looking at taking up another climate bill, and it's really and it, it is an exciting time. The chair of the TUE committee, the House chair, was out here last week touring hydro facilities 
in, um, in Shelburne Falls. So it was wonderful to be there with him in those buildings, which are very, very old and need to be updated. And the potential for battery storage in those facilities right there is something really exciting that we can be talking about. And it was great to have him here in Western Massachusetts, especially since one of his favorite places is the Montague Book Mill and I got to have lunch there. <laughs> so, so let's talk about grid modernization. We were able to get this into the wind bill on the house side. Massachusetts has an antiquated electrical grid that was built for centralized generation. It was designed to carry energy from power generation stations to end users. And this has presented real challenges for distributed generation from solar and wind. It's provided challenges for net metering, battery storage, and other modern technologies. So if today's grid cannot support this green technology, and we know that it cannot, it will be impossible for the Commonwealth to meet the renewable energy goals that we have set forth in, and then legislation that we've already passed. Our existing structure will not allow for the green energy revolution that is necessary for us to fight climate change. Take, for example, your attempts to install solar projects on our outdated grid that requires you to pay astronomical interconnection fees to make those projects happen. These fees end up killing projects. So the DPU took initial steps on grid modernization in 2014, but its grid modernization proceedings have been too slow and too friendly to utilities. Yes, that's very... <laughs> we need a friend in the DPU. Uh, the inclusion of grid modernization language in the House bill charts a course to address these problems. The House bill requires the DPU to direct electric distribution companies to develop plans to upgrade the transmission and distribution grid in order to meet the statewide greenhouse gas emissions limits. These plans must detail how these companies will proactively improve grid reliability and resiliency, increase customer access to renewable and distributed energy resources, and accelerate the Commonwealth's progress towards transportation electrification, building electrification, and decarbonization. Recognizing the importance of transparency and accountability in this process, the bill requires broad stakeholder engagement. These electric sector transformation plans must be developed in consultation with a newly created Grid Modernization Advisory Council. Additionally, Electric companies must conduct at least two public stakeholder meetings on these plans. The Advisory Council ensures that the people of the Commonwealth, including the environmental justice community, are at the table as we determine our energy future. And I just want to take a minute before we go to the single parcel rule to give a shout out to all of you who are supportive of this grid modernization language but especially the young people in our district who have said time and time again that we have been too slow to act and we need to act urgency, urgently and immediately. So I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of the young people who have really pushed this as a major issue at the statewide level and their voices are being heard. Beautiful. Absolutely. Um, so... Uh, in addition to the net metering, um, in addition to the, sorry, grid mod um, that both Rep. Lay and I had been focused on this sec session, we've also been focused on um, what's called the single tax parcel rule. Um, and here I want to thank, and Claire, I see you shaking your head. Oh, single, right, right. I always say tax, right. Single parcel. I don't know why I say that. Um, single parcel rule. Thank you. Um, uh, I think about, yeah. I think about tax provisions there. So it's single parcel. And um, thank you for the head shake. Um, uh, uh, and I want to thank you actually for raising the alarm about this um, early on. Um, so the single parcel rule, not the single tax parcel rule, um, was created by the DPU to uh, limit net metering on a single parcel. Um, DPU designed this because they wanted to prevent gaming the system at the time. They thought that you know, there would be some vulnerability if there were multiple units able to net meter on a single parcel, um, where a company or a person could set up these multiple net metering facilities. 
but the rule was too broad and it prevented legis legitimate uh, net metering. So here's an example, um, and this actually happened. We were out at Village Hill in Northampton where all of the condos and homes are located on one tax parcel. That's why I say single tax parcel. Um, uh, one tax parcel, so only one household can access the net metering on Village Hill currently, and that is preventing the growth of solar um, on those homes. Or, or Leverett, for example, where the library, elementary school, and safety complex are all on the same tax parcel, right? It's a single parcel limit. So Leverett already has solar installed at the library, and they want to install solar on the safety complex, but currently they could not net meter on their safety complex because they are net metering on the library. So they can't benefit from the gains of solar. Um, and that's really curtailed the industry. Um, and, and actually take other co-housing developments out here in Western Massachusetts. We live differently, um, some of us in these co-housing developments. They are on a single tax parcel. Um, so the bill that Rep. Lay and I filed would codify exemptions in the new law to the single parcel rule um, for people who are not trying to game the system, simply trying to help the proliferation of solar, um, like the good people at Village Hill, good people at Leverett, other co-housing developments. So right now, DPU has an exemption process, um, but it can cost $10,000. Um, upwards of $10,000 in just legal fees to get through that process. It's also arduous and it provides it, uh, just a barrier, too much of a barrier. So we hope that this is going to be included in the Senate bill. So what more can we do? Obviously there is more that we can and should be doing every single day. So one of the things that we've been working really closely on with the communities around the area and with stakeholders is on the first light relicensing project process, which is governed by FERC uh, at the federal level. But here at the state level, we have a very important role to play in the water quality process and making sure that the state is working for us when it comes to protecting that water quality and ensuring that stakeholders across the region have a, an ability to participate in that project and for their voices to be heard. So that is happening right now. Uh, I also want to point to the DCR landscape designation 10 year update. We're hearing loud and clear from you about the necessity for forest management and this is, a pro this is going to be a process that is just starting. It will also be another way for the public to weigh in on these and on updating the guidelines that DCR uses to manage all state-owned land. And Senator Comerford and I have been in touch with the new DCR commissioner to ask that there be a robust public process to ensure that your voices can be heard in this process. Another area where I, we know that you're very concerned, because we are as well, um, is PFAS. PFAS is a class of about 9,000 um, people-made chemicals. I want to shout out here to UMass, um, Dr. Reckow, Patrick Whitbolt, and the Water Ecological Technology Facility there. They are doing the nationwide groundbreaking research and work um, to detect PFAS and to try to figure out if we can mitigate it. Um, the reality, though, friends, is that it's hard to mitigate PFAS contamination. Um, and we've, uh, and the state, thanks to the state, we've begun to test uh, both public sources and private sources, and we know that PFAS is here throughout Western Massachusetts. Again, it's a, it's a man-made, people-made chemical base. It's the kind of chemical that you'll find in takeout containers to prevent um, seepage or in Teflon pans or in baby products or makeup. You name it, it's there. Um, and so both Rep. Lay and I are pushing in the legislature to ban PFAS. We must ban it from the Commonwealth completely. There are alternatives. Um, and if we incentivize a market for those alternatives by banning the chemicals, those alternatives will become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And the state can incentivize the production of those alternatives. The chemical has no place 
um, in the Commonwealth if we want water quality and water safety to be a primary concern. Um, so that is a place where we're pushing pretty hard. There is a PFAS task force, and both Rep. Lay and I have been um, advocating with that task force. I have a bill to ban PFAS in a range of chemical products, and in, in public health, it's been a place where I've focused considerably. Um, and we'll just talk quickly about uh, healthy soils. So a healthy soil bill that Rep. Lay and I fought for was passed last session in the Economic Development Bond Bill. Um, there is now a specific program in the Commonwealth. We have to get money for it um, every year, but uh, it's there. It's focused on healthy soils, and there's soon going to be a statewide healthy soil action plan. Now, why is that important? It's important, again, for a range of sectors um, that have have a, a connection with our soil like our farmers. Many farmers in Western Massachusetts are farming right now with low or no till, um, meaning they don't till up, they don't churn up the soil. This is hard. This is not easy to do. We should clap for our farmers for sure. Um, they are, they're leading the Commonwealth in this work. Um, but they're doing it without any state support, relatively. Uh, so they need new equipment, they need, uh, they need um, capacity building, they need experts to come out and talk to them about how to improve yields, it does improve yields over time, and how to actually grow the health of their soil. And with a statewide Healthy Soils Action Plan, hopefully we'll be able to amass more of those resources. And here, a shout out to UMass Extension, um, which has been leading the way and helping to help our farmers understand about the potential here. Uh, this was a monumental effort. Senator Comerford really did a great job leading that through. Um, I want to talk about the state-owned land payment in lieu of taxes program, otherwise known as SOL, pilot. And that SOL could mean a lot of things. But yes, it ends up leaving rural communities behind because we have a lot of state-owned land. And this is in, we want that to increase year after year. But the problem has been that that line item has not been fully funded. There's a $15 million gap. And the formula is disproportionately disincentivizes this program here in Western Massachusetts. So we have been able to increase uh, last year in the budget by $5 million, and we're hoping to do that over the next two years to close that $15 million gap so that our rural communities here in Western Massachusetts can be adequately reimbursed for their state-owned land. And we're leading the effort to try to change the formula to ensure that rural communities are seeing the benefits so that we are incentivized to protect land and that we are not feeling as though we are bearing this burden on behalf of the Commonwealth. Um, I do want to take one other, it's, this isn't on here, but I have to talk about it because Bob brought up potholes. Um, there's, a, there's a bill that I've introduced on unpaved roads. Now, unpaved roads end up being a real cost for our municipalities, particularly as we're dealing with these more frequent, frequent freeze-thaw cycles, and more intense storm events. What we're also seeing is that there's a lot of dirt and runoff going off into our streams that are often located beside our roadways. This is a real, this is a real environmental issue as we're, looking at these, as we're looking at the future that you laid out for us. So I just want to point out this piece of legislation that I've offered to establish a committee to look at the cost of unpaved roads to our municipalities, but also the environmental impact of not maintaining them to our streams and rivers. Um, FERCOG has developed a map that you can go onto and click your roadway if you're on an unpaved road or if you know about an unpaved road that needs improvements. You can click on it, you can type in the state of that roadway, you can upload pictures, uh, and so for those of you who can and you have the time, please do take advantage of that because it is providing us with the, some of the research that we need to make the case for this investment in unpaved roads. So you can find that on FERCOG's website. As we head into mud season, that's going to be critically important because let me tell you, people in Boston do not understand mud season or dirt roads. So thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you so much for allowing us this opportunity. <clears throat> opportunity.